Everything you're hearing is from the Home Depot, from the baseboards and nails, to these throw pillows, even those super soft sheets. Because now at the Home Depot, you can get everything for your bedroom, from wooden nightstands to modern benches. Save up to 25% on select bedroom furniture, plus free and flexible delivery and easy in-store returns. Shop decor now at homedepot.com. More saving, more kinds of doing. Valid on select items online only. Free delivery on select items, $45 or more. Visit homedepot.com for more information. Welcome to Creating a Family, Talk About Adoption and Foster Care. Today we're going to be talking about raising a child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, otherwise known as as FASD. Here's a sample of what you're going to hear. Usually the most challenging behaviors often are the secondary behaviors. And at as we understand who a child is and make a good fit between who they are and their environment and our expectations, there tends to be less secondary characteristics. And the, the earlier, like I'm saying, that we can um, understand this, usually there are less secondary characteristics that develop. Before we get started, I want to ask a favor of you. Would you please pop over to iTunes and give us a rating? It is the method that iTunes uses to both rank shows, but more importantly, to suggest uh, podcasts to uh, those who are listening. Um, We read every single one of the comments, and we often email them between ourselves uh, for inspiration to keep us doing what we do. So please, it really helps. If you'll pop over there, we would really appreciate it. This show is brought to you by one of our corporate sponsors, or actually it's not a corporate, it's a foundation sponsor, the Jockey Being Family Foundation. Uh, Jockey Being Family is in the business of supporting organizations who provide post-adoption support. It is time now to get your ticket for the Jockey Being Family Gala and Golf Classic. It is through this fundraiser that they are able to support organizations such as Creating a Family and this show. Uh, The gala is a blast. It's going to be held on March 19th and 20th at the Grand Genova Resort and Spa, which is on Lake Genova in Wisconsin, which is not very far from Chicago. So buy your tickets now at jockeybeingfamily.com. We're going to be there as well, and we would love to meet you uh, for a fabulous evening. Or if you're a golfer, perhaps on the golf course, although, quite frankly, we will not be on the golf course. We're and we haven't found a single person on our staff who can play golf. So we're going to skip that, but we will certainly be at the gala of the night before. So we'd love to connect with you there. Today we're going to be talking about raising a child with FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. We'll be talking with Suzanne Emery. She is a program director with FACETS, which is a nonprofit focused on helping parents raised children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She is also the mom of a son with FASD. So, so Suzanne, I guess your, your knowledge is both personal as well as professional, which is probably the best, best sort of knowledge for, for, for a teacher. So thank you so much for being with us today, Suzanne, to talk about this important topic. Um, you know, parents of, uh, who have adopted or foster parents, so adoptive or foster parents, uh, often face the issue of raising a child with FASD, uh, and it is a challenge that, that many of us face. Um, and often the reality is uh, it is difficult for parents to know how impacted a child will be at the time of adoption or foster placement, uh, especially this is the case if the child is young. So uh, how does alcohol, prenatal alcohol exposure affect, affect the brain of a developing fetus? Yes, well, it, um, because it is a spectrum, um, it can affect the brain in many, many different forms and different ways. Um, so a child that's prenatally exposed to alcohol could actually go through life with minimal um, difficulties and may not even appear um, to be on the spectrum, um, all the way to a child who is severely affected um, and has a really hard time just functioning, doing basic daily 
tasks. So um, alcohol is a teratogen, which um, it affects the developing brain in, in different ways. It actually, the actual neuron, which is um, the brain cell, it um, damages that structure. And I won't get into the nitty-gritty of um, the, the pieces of the neuron and what's affected, but it does affect that structure as well as, in general, the way the brain is developed. So the pathways, the ability for the brain to communicate from one area to the next, um, to, the, to another area, which um, can cause many different um, difficulties or challenges. Um, but just structurally, um, there often is a slower processing. So these can be children that, although they appear to have a big vocabulary and talk a lot, they may be only understanding at a pace of like one out of every three words. Um, you know, let or me stop you there. Well, Suzanne, let me stop you there for a moment because I, I'm, I'm glad that you were talking to us about the fact that, in fact, the actual brain structure – uh, of a person who was exposed to alcohol prenatally often looks the brain itself will look different than the brain of a uh, of a person who was not exposed and i think it's helpful to and this is what you were just getting ready to uh but i wanted to lay to to, to go into but i wanted to lay the groundwork i think it's helpful uh to talk about uh, make a distinction between what we see in people or in children with FASD that is a direct result of the brain difference, of the brain damage caused by alcohol versus what we may see that's caused by the frustration in, uh, of living with failure and, and not being understood on a daily basis. So, uh, what, And what you were just jumping into is some of the, of the actual differences that we would see in a child who has brain damage caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. One is the slow processing uh, speed, um, the ability of that person, of that child, to take in information, and you were speaking of verbal information, and understanding it and then and then acting upon it, so a slower processing speed. Okay, what are some of the other uh, characteristics that you might notice in a child who has FASD caused by the brain right. damage? Uh huh. Some other very common ones are developmental age. So, for example, a child may be chronologically 10, but in many areas they may be functioning more like um, a child half their age, so about five. It, and this is confusing because it's not across the board. There could be some areas where they're actually functioning um, like a child older than 10, but in many areas they could be functioning um, about half their chronological chronological age, so that's called dismaturity, which is a very common characteristic um, in children that have been prenatally exposed to alcohol. There can also be um, memory difficulties, both short and long term. So um, these children usually, um, it doesn't, you, you can't tell them something one time and they remember it and are able to build on that information. They often need reteaching. They need um, information multiple times in different modalities to be able to grasp that information and um, build on that information. Um, they often have a lot of different challenges, for example, in what we call executive functioning. So the ability to plan, to organize, to understand consequences, for example, to associate behavior with what we often do um, with behaviors is reward or give consequences. They have a hard time making that link. They tend to be um, children that are very impulsive, that don't have that moment to think before they talk or before they um, do something. Um, there can be um, challenges in communication, um, so language and communication. So they may, um, for example, um, like with rules, um, they can hear the rules. They can tell you what the rule is and what will happen if they break the rule. And then when they actually break the rule, they don't understand why they're receiving the consequence. So they... Um, it gets very confusing for parents and caregivers 
um, because it appears that they're understanding more than they are. Um, I'd say those are a few of the, the most common areas. There's a lot of different um, characteristics and behaviors that we see as a result of the damage um, from prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, often we, I hear of parents saying that their uh, child with FASD is also more stimulative to lights, sounds, temperatures, taste, touch, so sensory uh, um, processing issues. Uh, do you see that as well? Yes, definitely. The sensory um, system is um, a, another very common area that is affected in exactly what you're saying. It can, there can, um, they can be children that are very easily overstimulated or the opposite, um, understimulated, yeah. or yes, very sensitive to things in the environment, noise and lights and people. And um, so yeah, these kind of things can make it challenging, um, especially when they get to be school age in the kind of yeah. educational environments that children are often in. And do you see that that it's a fairly good rule of thumb to say that the child's developmental age would be about half of their chronological age, and obviously that somewhat depends. I mean, it becomes more, the general rule becomes more uh, set as the child gets older, but is that just, is that a good general rule of thumb? Yeah, I would say it's definitely a generality, um, but um, as I work with parents in my experience, I think it's very common that at least in uh, many areas, a child may be developing, I mean, may be uh, functioning about half their, develop their chronological age in, su in some areas. In other areas, like I said, they could actually be performing above their chronological age. But mm -hmm. um, socially and in these, some of these areas that we're talking about, about language, understanding language, um, processing social um, interactions, um, definitely often they're performing at about half their developmental, or their, sorry, I keep getting those words confused, chronological <laughs> age. Yeah, I do that too. The, uh, uh, all right, so we've talked about the things that you've mentioned are things that are direct result, are, are behaviors, um, are difficulties that are a direct result of the brain damage caused by the alcohol exposure. Now, I want to start talking about some of, of, of the secondary behaviors that we might see that, as I mentioned before, are, are less a result of the actual brain damage, but more from just the fact that a, a child with, the, with, a, brain, with a, a damaged brain has to work harder and, and, and faces more failure and, and more being misunderstood than, than another child. So who doesn't have brain damage? So what are some of the secondary behaviors that we might see uh, caused by this frustration and, and life with uh, a brain uh, 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 with brain damage? Right. So some of the secondary behaviors um, can be things like um, um, getting angry very quickly, having outbursts, being frustrated. Um, withdrawn, they can actually kind of shut down and go into themselves. Um, it can be things such as um, acting out inappropriately um, in a in a sexual way, um, depression, um, all of those kind of behaviors are really um, alarms to us. And as you're saying, they're called secondary characteristics that any of us would develop over time if we were um, chronically frustrated and stressed or if what the people around us were expecting more out of us than we can actually um, do. And I would add difficulty in making friends and fatigue um, because, as we said, these kids are working hard uh, just to get through a day, harder than someone else. So. I would throw in, and, and difficulty yes. making friends because these behaviors, uh, as well as the brain damage itself, um, make it harder. All right. Definitely. Uh, I, I think that is it. I think that we often think of kids with FASD as, as having 
more behavioral problems than a child without fetal alcohol exposure. Is that is that a general rule of thumb, or if raised within an understanding environment that uh, addresses uh, and is set up to handle and help the child handle the the brain damage that may be caused or has been caused, um, would the secondary behaviors necessarily always develop? Right. That's a that's a great question, and that's exactly why. I do what I do, and FACETS, the organization I'm a part of, we teach what's called the FACETS brain-based model. And what we see is when, from an early age, children are understood for who they are and what they can and can't do, Um, and there is an awareness that there could be an invisible, really FASD is an invisible um, brain-based disability. And when that is understood, usually the most challenging behaviors often are the secondary behaviors. And as we understand who a child is and make a good fit between who they are and their environment and our expectations, there tends to be less secondary characteristics. And the the earlier, like I'm saying, that we can um, understand this, usually there are less secondary characteristics that develop. So it can still be challenging for parents to understand what those primary characteristics are and to provide the supports and accommodations around a child for them to be successful. But those tend to be less challenging for parents to Um, understand and to um, provide those accommodations than when a child has lived a long time not being understood and has developed these secondary um, characteristics. Um, And then that's where we usually see and people are interpreting these kids as um, behavior problems or um, even, you know, misinterpreting those kind of behaviors and thinking that they're lying or being manipulative or rebellious or all these kind of words that we use to judge children without really understanding the root of the behavior. You had talked before, and I think the word you used was dismaturity, but Another way to say that would be a wide gap between different areas or types of maturity. An example of that would be, let's say, a child who's chronologically 15 but has the language skills or the expressive language of a 20-year-old, the social skills of maybe an 8-year-old, a uh, the reading decoding skills maybe age on, you know, 15, but the reading comprehension of an 8-year-old and maybe the math skills of a 7-year-old, something along those lines. Uh-huh. Um, so we we see a which has led people and this is a term some people like and some people don't but a swiss cheese brain um and w- the reason that that the people who use that term like it is that it's a it it explains the fact that there are there there are differences it's not across the board that the child is functioning at at whatever half or or whatever percentage and and so and in fact you use the term an invisible disability, and I like that as well because oftentimes these children do have, like, say, the example you gave was their expressive language. Oftentimes their expressive language is strong. So they can be carrying on a conversation and with someone, a teacher or, uh, you know, their uh, their coach or, uh, or a friend, and they're and they're right there with you. You know, they're 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 sounding like a let's say if it's a 15 year old, they're right smack. You know, their 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 language is exactly what you would expect. And yet there are gaps that that, and that other ways they simply won't and can't reach this level. They are not able. So what are some of the problems that this causes? This gap, this the fact that it's in, the, the the disability is invisible and can also be often be masked by strengths in one area that is not matched by uh, strengths across the board. Right. Um, another great question, and um, I would say one of the biggest problems this creates is a misunderstanding in what the person's real capabilities are. So, for example, when we see that a child is incredibly able to express themselves and even use vocabulary, really, that a a child would use above their chronological age, we assume 
that the child can also understand and process at a pace that they're talking at. And so when we don't get that response back um, or them being able to either do what we're asking them to do or to respond in a way that we're interpreting they should be able to, that's where um, this huge gap in what we're expecting and what they can do um, is, is mismatched and the child will then become frustrated because we're expecting something of them that they really can't do and yet it's not visible to us unless we understand um, what's behind um, the behavior. So, um, for example, um, I, my son, we were up here in, we used to live in Costa Rica and we were up here in the summer and my mother asked my son with um, FASD to go out in the backyard to the freezer and get three things. And immediately he said no. Um, And she knew enough at that point to just kind of ignore that. And she asked my other son to do the same thing, and he went out and got them. But a whole hour later, my mom heard this knock on the back door, and there was my younger son with the three things that she had asked him to get, And she came to me with tears rolling down her face because she said, I think I'm beginning to understand Edwin's disability. What that no didn't mean that he didn't want to help or he was being rebellious. It meant, Grandma, I need some time to think about what you just told me, to remember the three things, to transition from what I'm doing right now to going out and getting that. And it took him a whole hour to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's that kind of a... A situation where we could interpret a behavior as um, whatever, being rebellious, manipulative, and actually that's not what's going on. It's, in this case, the example I gave was a processing, a mm-hmm. slower processing. Mm-hmm. Do children outgrow the effects of FASD? Children um, with FASD, it's a permanent um, physical brain-based disability, that is not to say that there's not progress and maturity. And in my experience, what often um, happens is that children um, are slower to mature and slower to progress, but oftentimes once they get into their middle 20s, 30s, that gap between their developmental age and their chronological age actually kind of closes um, in and um, they they do it, it w- depends where they are on the spectrum. Some some children will become adults that can live independently and function very well without external support, and others will probably need some different kinds of support their entire life in order to be able to be successful. So it's it's really important to remember it is a spectrum. And um, even though it is a permanent disability, um, it, we do see progress and maturity um, happen, but it's usually at a much slower pace than a neurotypical child. And one of the hallmarks of a, a child with FASD is literal concrete thinking, which means they tend to get the pieces rather than the concept. Um, and uh, some of the, before we um, move into talking about specific skills, I thought I would uh, just say some of the characteristics of, of literal concrete thinkers who, who, miss the, who, who oftentimes miss the bigger picture. Um, as you've pointed out, they will be uh, sometimes, uh, often rather, slower to think in, in their hearing speeds, which is really what we're saying is their processing, is the example you gave with your son. The processing speed is simply slower. They will often have trouble storing and retrieving information. That goes back to the, the memory issues that you had talked about. Uh, forming links and, and associations between information uh, is often difficult which which leads right into the the risk and reward or the risk and consequences or the action and consequences um, that is just it is usually slower and uh, difficulty in generalizing from one thing to generalizing to 
uh, more things, something like that, and seeing the next step or the outcome. That's, that goes back to the forming of the association and the links. If I do this, X will happen, because in the past when I have done this, X will happen. Um, that is slower to, to develop. Um, and another thing is uh, oftentimes children with FASD and the brain damage it causes are highly suggestible and thus, quite frankly, at risk for exploitation by other children as well as other adults. So all of this um, complicates and there's something, uh, parenting, and are, these are all things that we need to think about as, uh, as parents of children uh, who may have been uh, exposed. And, and oftentimes we won't know for sure. Uh, but if we have a child that is uh, displaying some of these either primary uh, characteristics of brain damage or secondary characteristics of living a life with brain damage, that's a good indication. Um, and we will um, uh, now we'll circle around to talking about uh, parenting tips. But first, I want to take a moment uh, to remind people that this show and everything we do on this show is uh, brought to you or is made possible by the support of our partners who believe in our mission of providing unbiased, accurate information to uh, both adoptive and foster parents as well as to the professionals who serve them. One such partner is Holt International. They were founded in 1956, and they want every child to have a loving and secure home. They have programs that help them, that strengthen and preserve families that are at risk of separation, and, of course, they lead the global community in finding families for children who need them. We also have Spence Chapin. They are a licensed and accredited nonprofit organization in the New York City metro area, that has been offering adoption services for more than 100 years. And they also, and this is something I am so pleased about uh, with Spence Chapin, they have a robust post-adoption services, uh, both to all, all members of the triad, adoptive parents, but also birth parents and adoptees. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that I'm very proud that, that they've chosen to support us as well. Now I want to talk about parenting tips for parents who are parenting a child who they either know or believe has, uh, is somewhere on the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I think it's important to, to reiterate something, Suzanne, that you said at the very beginning, and it is a spectrum. So a lot depends on the, uh, the, the timing and the duration and the quantity of alcohol that was consumed, so as to, as well as the uh, temp, uh, the the susceptibility, the genetic perhaps susceptibility of the child as to where the child will fall on the spectrum. So when we're talking about parenting tips, obviously we're going to have to um, uh, acknowledge uh, where our child is and, and adjust accordingly. All right, so uh, let's start with is where I, I always think we should start with in parenting, regardless whether our kids have uh, have have brain damage, uh, or if they have something else going on, or nothing going on, and that is to focus on our child's strengths. Why is that so important with a child with FASD? Yes, this is um, extremely important for any child, but especially a child um, with um, FASD. And actually, strengths are considered um, part of the primary characteristics, or that piece that is a reflection of how a child's brain works. So this is um, really important because it's so common that a child with fetal alcohol um, experiences so much frustration and so much um, every day that um, kind of a sense of failure that they have a really hard time meeting others' expectations, that to be able to identify a child's strengths and their gifts and um, their talents, and that includes the way they learn, um, is really the foundation for building a plan um, around them and to focus on um, helping them develop and use the strengths they have instead of focusing on the things that are difficult for them and trying to make them do those things. So we find that there's much greater success for these children when we focus on their strengths 
instead of focusing on the challenges and weaknesses and trying to make them do, oftentimes what they can't do or they're not ready to do um, at that moment. And that's a challenge because so often as a parent, we, we start becoming frightened. We think, oh, my gosh, you know, if they don't start learning whatever it is, you know, to listen to me so that they, I don't have to repeat something 100 times, you know, where are they going to be in this world? I mean, how are they going to ever live independently? So there's such a temptation for us to focus on, on let's just, I've got to catch them up. I've got to. I've got to get them to hear me. I've got to get them to stop asking me the same questions over and over, that type of thing. Um, so it's important that and it gets so important to to, um, to to remind people that our children do have strengths, and let's kind of let's hone in on that and make that the cornerstone of our relationship and our parenting. Um, okay, so we've got a child that's developmental age is significantly lower than the chronological age. Should we be treating them? as to their chronological age in order to help them get there, or should we treat them uh, and parent them? When I say treat, I mean parent them um, at their developmental age. Right. <clears throat> that, I think, um, to answer that question, I think we need to remember um, that no matter who the person is or who the child is, to always treat that child um, in a respectful way. So it's not that we're going to, with a 10-year-old, for example, that's functioning more like five, um, talk down to them or in any way make them feel um, like they're not 10. But it's in our minds when certain behaviors happen to ask ourselves the question, if this child were, were really only five, how would I respond in this situation. Um, and that kind of changes um, both our emotional um, state, the, the parents or caregivers' emotional state, as well as the appropriate way to respond in any given, given situation. So it's not treating a child necessarily younger than they are, but it's thinking if the child were only half their chronological age, how would I um, confront this situation or how would I respond to it? And often just that um, helps the parent respond in an appropriate way that fits with where the child is developmentally and also then helps that child not to be frustrated um, and to, to have an appropriate level of expectation around um, whatever the task is or the situation is. And let's give an example. Let's say, let's use your example of a 10-year-old, uh, and she is wanting to, uh, um, school is three blocks away, and 10-year-olds at her school are walking um, by themselves uh, to and from school. And as a parent, you have concerns uh, about whether your 10-year-old, who is developmentally more like a 5-year-old. So let's use that as an example, how you might, uh, how that might influence your parenting of that child with this specific situation. Right. So, again, as you said at the beginning of this piece, every child will be different. Um, and so it, it's hard to make a, a generalized statement um, about this. But like, what, like we're talking about, if a 10-year-old is really more like five in a lot of areas, um, the good question to ask would be in this situation, um, if my child was only five, would I let them walk by themselves to school at this stage of the game? And I'm sure as a parent, um, you, depending on where you live and what you know about your child and um, how vulnerable they could be, if it's a safe area to walk, um, you need to take all those things into consideration to make sure that that is a wise decision. Sometimes it can be, you know, if there's an older sibling or there's a um, neighbor that um, is a responsible and somebody that can make, you know, good choices, um, it may be pairing up the child with fetal alcohol um, with either a sibling or somebody else that could kind of watch over them and make sure that they get there safely. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's knowing who your child is and um, what they're capable of 
what they may have difficulties with and trying not to put them in situations that could um, be could put them at risk um, in the situation walking by themselves to school. Okay, another um, common parenting tip we hear for parents of uh, children with FASD is to provide structure. Uh, let's uh, let's explore that. Structure is a is one of my uh, something that I again I think that most children actually I think most families need a fair amount of structure uh, to, to function in harmony. But I think that children with FASD likely need more structure. So uh, let's talk about what types of structure children with FASD might need and how can parents provide the structure uh, across the – and let's, let's talk about ideas for not only for a 5-year-old but for a 10-year-old and a, a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old so that we give – examples that would go across the age spectrum. Right. So, yes, and I, I'm probably, it probably sounds like I'm repeating myself all the time, but, again, we have to remember it's a spectrum, so we can't prescribe any certain amount of structure for all children with fetal alcohol. It's going to be different what each child needs. Um, but in general, it's true that children with fetal alcohol do need um, a certain amount of structure and routine to be able to function well. And the reason is when our brains um, are, have grown in a disorganized way <clears throat> and we, um, we have different um, areas of the brain that are damaged, the person relies on external structure and organization and routine to be able to function. So, for example, for probably a lot of children um, with FASD, as much as possible, and we live in a real world where things change and move, but as much as possible to provide the child with a stable, um, structured schedule that doesn't change all the time. And this is why also school environments can be very difficult because often children are changing from class to class or even from room to room or moving from one place to another or maybe, you know, they're, they have a substitute teacher one day all, or something's moved even in the environment, um, like we move furniture around. Um, all of those things can be very disturbing to children with fetal alcohol and cause them to really not be able to function. Um, and I'll give a really brief example with this one too. We had a routine in our house that just for breakfast, we, one day we'd eat cereal and one day we'd eat something else for breakfast. And it, we'd go you know, every other day like this. And one day, I don't know why, but I forgot where we were in that schedule. And I served, it was a cereal day and I served something else. And when my son came to the table, it was like the world had ended. He melted. He was, um, at this point, probably like 12 years old. Um, and that was just enough to really ruin the whole entire day. He, he was mm -hmm. off the whole entire day. And so it can be little things like that that they rely on to function and to feel organized and um, to be able to navigate the world. And like I said, it's not always possible for parents to do that 100%. But as much as we can, it usually helps a child be able to regulate themselves and to be settled enough that they can depend on the outward structure and routine to function as well as they can internally. <clears throat> Excuse me. And bringing these structures, this, this schedule, um, putting it in a – writing a list of what the day will be and, and keeping in mind that a lot of children, even older kids, will do better with a visual schedule. And you, would, you wouldn't use you know, cartoon things as you might for a five-year-old, but you can take pictures of the actual something so that it, to accompany the words. So a schedule that says, you know, we get up at this time, we brush our teeth. After we brush our teeth, uh, we put on the clothes that were laid out uh, on the chair the night before. We uh, come down to breakfast. Uh, on Monday it is, you know, but with cereal. On Tuesday it's eggs or whatever it is, if, 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 that, if you have that in your, in your routine. Then we uh, get our backpack. 
um, and so and just very, and then we go to school, and we come back, and on Monday uh, we go to flute lesson, uh, and then we come home, you know, whatever. That it's that we that the child can see the the schedule. That also for some for some children um, that allows parents to, if there's going to be a change flute teacher calls and says, I'm sick today, so they're not going to do it. They can point to the place on the schedule and even perhaps scratch it out so that the child has a visual uh, reminder of what the schedule is going to be. So something that concrete. So make your schedules as concrete as possible is a, um, is a, good, is a good thought. Um, another technique that, that people use to provide structure are lists. Um, I know of a family that has a... Uh, a backpack list, a school backpack list, and every morning one of the child has to check off the list. Homework is in the homework folder. Uh, lunch is put in. Um, I have a pencil, or you know, pencil is there, or whatever the, you know, whatever needs to be in the uh, backpack. Uh, have you found lists such as that? Are there other examples you can think of where a a list uh, is effective? Again, I think it will be really different from child to child. Um, for some children, um, that may be helpful if they are visual and they can read. Um, that's the other really important um, thing mm-hmm. to think about if um, you're going to use that. I think the most Although important. Although you could do, the family I knew of actually took pictures, uh, so oh, that yeah. it was yeah. yeah yeah. So the child yeah. uh, the child could read, but didn't. But the words usually didn't mean a lot. So so pictures is what they were they used. But go ahead. Right. No, I, I'm just saying um, I think it's hard in general to give techniques or ideas that are going to work across the board because every child is really different, and that's why it's important to know their strengths and how they learn. And um, we always want to ask the question with any strategy we're going to use, what does a person's brain have to be able to do to, for this strategy to be effective? Um, Because we can try, and a lot of this is trial and error. So example with Mm -hmm. a list, um, we could try that, and if it works, great. But if it doesn't, instead of continuing to try to use the list, we want to ask the question, why isn't this working? And what might be something that might be more helpful? Um, Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, where um, at least the model we use is very different than a lot of other parenting strategies for kids with fetal alcohol because it's not prescriptive. There's not a recipe. You have to look at every child as an individual and kind of go through. um, We have a couple different kind of grids that we work through with any different situation that are very individually based to try to help parents understand whatever they're trying to have their child do, um, what the brain is able to do, and um, then get to an accommodation or an idea that may work for any given situation or expectation. And you can get some of that information at their website, which is facets, F-A-S-C-E-T-S dot org. So, uh, yeah, and the purpose of what we're doing is you're right. We're not trying to be prescriptive of saying what will work for every child. But I do want to give ideas for parents of things to try. Because looking at your child and knowing that your child is struggling, then knowing that many children with FASD need structure uh, to help them thrive, what are some ways that, uh, that families can create structure for their child? And we've talked about having a, uh, a predictable routine. Uh, consider putting that routine uh, in some form of written or visual format so that that, that's actually something that the child can see. Uh, um, List is an idea if that's an area where your child struggles and if that is a a good adaptive technique for your child. Uh, Another one that works for uh, one of the things that children with FASD uh, often have trouble with is time management. So what are some adaptive techniques that parents might try if their child is struggling with time management. And let's give the example of a child that has trouble moving through the morning routine and getting out the door on time. Uh, What are some adaptive techniques that parents may want to consider trying if that's a struggle that their child has? Right. So, um, you know, some of the things you've already mentioned, 
may be helpful. And for morning routines, like thinking the night before, what, what can we possibly do the evening before to make the morning routine as simple and um, easy as possible? So laying out clothes or um, whatever will unclutter kind of that morning routine. Um, and then um, there are there are helps out there again. Children, as we've as we've said, um, with fetal alcohol, tend to think very concretely and literally. And time is a very abstract concept, mm-hmm. so it can be very hard for children to um, exactly understand time or that time is passing. Um, there is um, a device that comes in many different forms called the timed timer, which is a clock that you can actually see the time disappearing. It has a red kind of um, line that that will move and, you know, the child can actually see time disappearing. Sometimes something like that, that is very visual and concrete, can help a child um, understand how much time they have. But Mm -hmm. again, this this is an area where the child may simply need um, a lot of help from the parent, even at older ages um, as teenagers, to move from one step to the next in a way they may need to be reminded um, each step along the way. Um, and as we we're saying, you know, it, it can help to have that visual out for them to see what they need to get done in the morning, um, but they also may need you know, a gentle reminder, you know, whatever, it's time to get out of the mm-hmm. shower now or it's time to come down mm-hmm. for breakfast. And the fact that just knowing that um, and that, you know, sometimes the big frustration for the parent is that, do I really have to do this every day? Shouldn't they, yeah. shouldn't they know by now yeah. that this is what needs to happen and on this timeline? And for a neuro- neurotypical child, maybe, but for these children, the answer is no. You, you may have to do this every day, and they may need these little reminders and time and getting them moving from one thing to the next. And just the mm-hmm. fact that a parent could accept that that's what a child needs mm-hmm. um, to be able to do this also helps the emotional frustration in the parent if they can accept that. And it will help the child, too, not to feel like their parent is, you know, breathing down their back and every mm-hmm. morning starts out with, you know, a kind of battle trying to get the child out the door. Um, mm-hmm. So I think a huge piece is understanding where the child's difficulties are mm-hmm. and what they need. Um, to be able to help everybody get through, for example, a morning routine um, mm-hmm. in a calm way. Yeah, with without uh, ripping your hair out. Yeah, exactly. Right. I, I <laughs> like. I, and one suggestion for children who have moved into having uh, cell phones is uh, letting them set the reminder app or choosing a reminder app or on their phone. I mean, don't expect it to be a a miracle. But ultimately, your goal is if your child is ever going to be is does have the capability of of learning this skill, is teaching them how to manage it. Um, although knowing full well that oftentimes people with the brain damage caused by FASD uh, may always struggle with time management. All right, um, moving on to another. Uh, typical problem that many children with FASD have, and that is language processing. So what are some things that we parents can do? And and I will start because this is one that I have. I am a wordy person just by nature. If it can be said in ten words, uh, rather, if it can be said in one word, I will figure out a way to say it in ten words. And, uh, and, And that's something that oftentimes for many children who have slower processing, it's important to use fewer words, more direct, a lot less cushion words and, and soft words around it. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and get it out there in as few words as possible. Um, so I'll throw that out there. It's something that I have. It is a continual struggle uh, for me, um, but uh, for children who have language processing speed issues, I think it is very helpful. Uh, can you suggest some other techniques for uh, parents whose child does have language processing delays? Uh, how, how, what, what are some other things that a parent might think to do to make it easier for their child? 
Right. So as you said, um, our world moves very fast. And we tend to move very fast, and I don't think you're the only one that <laughs> speaks fast. A lot, most of us um, are, do, do speak very fast. So it takes a lot of intentionality to slow down and not mm. only say fewer words but talk um, slower um, mm. than we then would actually feel, you know, comfortable um, those are those are a couple things, really basic things that and can be helpful with that slower language processing. Again, um, the visual using more visual aids instead of verbal can be um, very helpful. Um, again, an example of this would be I used to be so frustrated because my son would be out playing when it was dinner time and I would be, you know, yelling out the door, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes. And no matter what I did or said, he would Uh never be in at the time that it was time for dinner. And so one strategy in any of these areas is to include the child in what might work. Um, because they often have amazing ideas that we would never come up with. And I asked my son in this circumstance, you know, I told him what was going on and what was frustrating to me. And I said, you know, buddy, can you think of something that might be helpful for you to be able to know when it's dinner time and come in? And he said, yeah, mom, why don't you make a big, huge sign with a hand, like motioning me to come in? Um, And I thought, oh, all right, well, and that's exactly what I did. I made this huge poster board, and instead of yelling or talking to him, I would just say his name, put the board up, and he would look at it, and he would come in. And um, that didn't work for forever, but it did work for a (laughs) while. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I would say always including the child in whatever strategy um, you're coming up with because they actually do have some amazing Ideas. I think another really important thing with this processing, um, most adults um, have an expectation that children should obey immediately. Like if an adult speaks or if they ask something of a child, we have this kind of value that, you know, immediate obedience is really important. And not that it's not, and obviously if it's a safety situation, there can't be any negotiating around that. But actually, for a lot of these kids um, that have slower processing, immediate obedience is not possible. We have to give time. So we say something, and um, it may take a little bit of time for them to be able to do whatever is needing to be done. So just remembering that actually processing speech is an incredibly complex Um, process in our brains and we don't even think about everything that our brain has to do to be able to listen to somebody and understand what they're saying and then generate a response. Um, And that can take significantly longer for these kids. So just kind of lowering the expectation of immediate obedience can also be a really helpful um, strategy, both for the parents, again, emotional response in situations, as well as for the child Um, to feel um, like they're not stressed and their brain is actually going to be able to work better and faster if the parent is not stressed around them. That creates kind of even a bigger brain block for the child. So I would say those are some of the, some of the, um, the ideas that seem to be helpful around the slower processing speed. Yeah, that is, those are, those are excellent. And I, I particularly like that on a number of occasions you've talked about set, setting our parental expectations at the right place so that our frustration is under control. Uh, and, and I hear that loud and clear that some of the, some of the best parenting techniques that, that we, can, we can do are having realistic expectations uh, why do I have to say this over and over? Well, because my child has brain damage. You know, I, I, I am not the one who came up with this, but uh, I know of a mom who has sticky pads that she, you know, the, the post-it notes or whatever, that she's placed strategically throughout the house that she will see, and it says um, it's brain damage to remind her that when she begins to get frustrated, it's a reminder to her, a visual clue of sorts, 
uh, to remind her that, yes, I have to parent differently and I need to control my expectations. So uh, that's something something else to think about. Um, <clears throat> another thing that um, uh, uh, that is helpful is to be very concrete in our expectations. Be home by five. Don't say, you know, I really need you to be, you know, around five. I want you here because we've got to do this. And if we're going to eat at six, you got to be, you know, blah blah blah. Um, no, just be home at five. And save the whys for later, or not even later, just save the whys. Um, uh, say fewer words and, and have it be very specific as to what you want. Um, all right, one of the things that, one another uh, technique that we often do with, with uh, neurotypical children is to give them choices. Although with some children with FASD, too many choices overwhelms them. So what are some ideas around ways that, uh, we can limit the amount of options our child has to decide between uh, if that's something your child struggles with. Right. So, yes, and as you just said, again, every child will be different in this. Um, but it is very common, again, that um, choices um, are very overwhelming to kids um, with fetal alcohol because there's a ton of brain tasks necessary to be able to make a choice, analyzing and um, mm -hmm. judgment and just a ton of different functions that may be very challenging for a child with fetal alcohol. Um, so, you know, again, it's going to be different with every child, but it, it can be helpful when um, at, at, some, at, at some point to um, really not give the child a bunch of choices, just say, you know, this is what we're going to do. Um, and as a child grows and progresses, and again, every child will be different, maybe some children will be, would be able to handle, um, you know, two choices versus three or four or five. Um, but as much as we can simplify life and, um, and help them, um, help them um, you know, with whatever the, the situation is where there may be a choice, it, it is it can be helpful sometimes, and it, and it feels really strange because we wouldn't usually do this with a neurotypical child to not give them a choice, to just say this is what's for lunch or this is what we're doing. Um, and you have to experiment. If that, if that is frustrating, that they don't have a choice, um, then to open it up a little bit. Um, but I think um, you do have to know your child and see how they respond to choices um, and how many choices, and um, it can be, it can decrease frustration for actually at different stages of life for the parent to kind of just say, this is what we're doing, or this is, um, and at, at, it, it may be appropriate to not give choices in some circumstances. Or even simplify the choices. Um, right. If you're, you know, do you want to clean up your room now, or do you want to clean it up in 30 minutes? Um, mm -hmm. something along so that you're giving a choice, but it is a, a, a simplified choice so that the child is getting experience, making decisions, but, uh, but it, you're not overwhelming them. Let's talk about sleep issues. Again, and we're going to sound like we're both going to sound like a broken record here. Uh, not all children with uh, FASD are somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, struggle with sleep, but many do, and, and partly it's because, and this is, I, I think we see it a little more as the children get older, and it's partly because of time management issues, as well as perhaps lack of structure and difficulties with self-regulation. For a host of reasons, many children with FASD, um, and again, especially as they, as, they, as they age, will struggle with sleep. So what are some things that if your child is struggling getting to bed and, and, and uh, uh, getting to sleep and getting enough sleep, uh, what are some things, what are some tips that parents can think about that might work to try? Mm -hmm. So, um, again, we always want to, with any um, strategy we're going to try, we want to think about what the child's strengths are. And, um, again, it will be different for every child. What, what might be helpful for them to um, have better success at going to sleep and being able to stay asleep. But in general, um, just like we were talking about structure, 
it's pretty important for all kids, and especially with kids um, with fetal alcohol, to have um, a routine at night. And so if, for example, you know, a bedtime is 8, um, to perhaps think a couple hours before that, what are the important steps to take to get a child ready and their sensory system to be able to settle, to be able to go to sleep? So um, definitely, you know, probably eating at least a couple hours before um, it's time to go to bed. Um, another real big issue with society in general, but especially with um, kids on the spectrum, is the whole screen um, time. Mm. And we know cool. um, scientifically that it takes our brains two hours to settle after having been in front of a screen. So whether that's TV or phone or video games, it's going to be pretty hard for them to settle if they haven't had a couple hours without being in front of a screen. So that could be a really important um, um, factor in helping them get to sleep. And then just kind of basic relaxing, which again will be different for every child, whether that's having them take a bath at night instead of in the morning, um, if they like to be read to, you can, there can be all kinds of things that can be used, like aromatherapy, mm-hmm. massage, if the child likes to have somebody, you know, with them. Um, and so really thinking about who your child is and what helps them relax um, and incorporating some of those elements into a night routine will definitely set them up for better success to be able to um, be able to go to bed and then to have a restful sleep and also assuring that, um, you know, they are getting enough Mm -hmm. sleep. As you mentioned earlier, these kids, um, because of the way their brain usually works less efficiently, they um, use up a lot of energy and calories just doing the basic things that for most of us during the day doesn't take a lot of energy. So they get more tired, they get exhausted, and um, they need, you know, probably even though some of them have a hard time sleeping, they, mm-hmm. they need um, rest at night and sufficient amount to be able to wake up um, and function as best as they can the next day. I'm so glad you said that because I think that that the they do need they they need more sleep uh, as a general rule because they're using a lot more energy and one of the other things that that we often see is that in order to have a less stressful morning routine one of the techniques is just to allow more time so you're not you're not you don't wake up running behind so you're not looking at your child going come on eat 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 get it in come on all right now get mm-hmm. your shoes on no you need to get your shoes on now and so uh, allowing enough time for your child to process through the morning routine means getting up earlier for a lot of families and that's unfortunate because you know that means the parent is getting less sleep too so prioritize, prioritizing sleep often means it, you know, going backwards from what time you want the child to be in bed to wake up early enough in the morning and then, and then moving backwards to say, okay, how much time do we realistically need for a routine that goes for, for a child to go from full speed to uh, restful uh, calmness that allows sleep? And that generally if you're sitting there adding those time, if you add up the time, it takes more time than most families initially think. So I think a helpful technique is for parents to think in terms of working backwards from the ideal bedtime and making certain that they've allowed enough time for a restful routine, which impacts every aspect of because it means what time you eat dinner, when you whether you shower, whether you, you know when you take your bath, that type of thing. So um, so that's a, a a great tip for parents to be thinking through. Um, What is the prognosis? I think this is probably the question on many parents' minds. Uh, There is so much fear in parenting, uh, even if we don't want that to be the controlling factor. When we have a child that is uh, not neurotypical, it's scary. We are afraid of what the future is going to bring. And that fear impacts our parenting, and sometimes it, it impacts us in ways that is not helpful for the child because we're, we're acting out of fear as opposed to uh, faith that this child, um, that we are, that what we're doing will make a difference to help this child. So, 
So what does the research show? And, again, we have to acknowledge that, that I'll just say it for you, but it uh, much depends on how impacted, how much brain damage the child has um, and, and, and the child's basic temperament as well. It's a, it's a multifactorial thing. It's not just the exact spot on a spectrum they are, but it's also um, many other things, including their environment um, and their own basic temperament. But what is the prognosis for a child who has significant prenatal alcohol exposure? Let's go ahead and say they're, they're more than just a mildly impacted. Right. Well, again, it will be different for every child and dependent on many, many, many factors. So I mentioned one earlier on that the earlier on in life, that um, parents and caregivers can be aware that a child has an invisible physical disability, brain-based disability, and then are understanding um, the child's difficulties and their strengths and building their parenting plans on a child's strengths, the better outcome there will be. Um, A part of that is also for a parent often to redefine what success is. So a lot of this, again, it goes back to the parents. You know, if our goal is for our child to graduate from high school and go to college and, you know, have such and such profession and be independent, um, that may or may not be realistic for a child with fetal alcohol. So we may need to readjust our expectations of what success is. And um, I know a family that after they understood their daughter in high school who was struggling so much in in many different areas, they actually um, decided she actually didn't finish high school, but she loved cats. And they did everything to help her figure out what she could do with her passion for cats. And she actually ended up being, she's a professional um, cat sitter now. And she's in her 30s and she's married and has one child. And she's extremely happy doing what she loves to do. So I think a huge piece, and I think there's a ton of hope for children with fetal alcohol because they all have amazing gifts and talents and strengths. And if we can grab onto those and encourage them to develop those and sometimes give up our own goals or expectations or what we think is success, um, I think um, there can be a really bright future for a lot um, of these kids. So I think those are the key things when we look at prognosis and a child's future. Um, a lot of it depends upon, you know, we're not, we can't control everything like the environment, but a lot of it is also educating everybody in that child's life, whether that's school, community, church, Um, to also understand who this person is and to appreciate them for who they are um, so that we can, as as much as possible, decrease the stress and frustration and um, expectations that are not appropriate for um, a child with different um, characteristics like children with fetal alcohol have. So that's how I would answer that question. Thank you so much. We have been talking today with Suzanne Emery. She is a program director with FACETS, a nonprofit focused on helping parents raise children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She is also speaking from experience as the mom of a son with FASD. The views expressed in this show are those of the guest and do not reflect necessarily the position of creating a family or our partners or our underwriters. Also, keep in mind that the information given is general advice to understand how it applies to your specific situation. You work with the professionals uh, that are involved in you and know you and your child directly. To get more information about uh, Suzanne as well as FACETS, uh, you can go to their website, which is FACETS, F-A-S-C-E-T-S dot org. Thanks for listening today, and I will see you next week. This February, history will be made. Millions will watch as 80 years of unjust stigma is left in the past. A product that drove good people to the black market will be revealed as one that's creating a new global market. This February, what inspired the symbol of counterculture will at long last be seen as just culture. The new normal is coming. Will you be one of the first to see it? Visit MedMen.com to watch an exclusive preview.